Hi, this is Tim Ackesy from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm pleased to be on this evening with Sean Kahn. And I've known Sean since he was a kid. He used to come in for speech therapy a little bit when he was a kid. Then he took an extensive break till high school. And then we had some real important things to work on. So I want to say hi to Sean Kahn and let him take over to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. How's it going? I'm Sean, uh, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and happy to be here today. Cool. So, Sean, I want to share something that we're going to expand on as we go on. I want to share, I want you to share two milestones, speech milestones that you had. Give us a little glimpse of what they were. And then we're going to talk about how you hit a grand slam in each one later on. Okay. Um, so I think my first speech milestone was when I was selected uh, to be a part of a MLK recitation. Um, so I spoke in a church in front of over 1,200 people on a microphone. And it was also broadcasted on live TV. Um, and then more recently, I was selected by my high school to give the spring benefit fundraiser speech, um, which helped to raise over uh, $200,000. Wow, 200 grand. Anyone yeah. who stutters knows how difficult it is to get up in front of 1200 people or do one of these things where you are selected as the keynote to raise money for a school. These are big things. If you do stutter or don't stutter, the number one fear of adults is speaking in front of a group. In this case, you grew up with a stutter. I grew up with a stutter. This can be terrifying. So we're going to expand on those two events as we go on this evening. I'd like to know, I'd like you to share with us a little bit what it was like to stutter as a child. Right. So, you know, obviously it was not easy. Um, I think all throughout my educational life, from preschool to even the end of college, um, you know, I was teased or bullied for not being able to speak fluently. Um, you know, I think about the most vivid memory of being ridiculed for my speech impediment was in the second grade when I asked to use the restroom. And I, I said, may I use the restroom? And I think I said, I about 50 times. So I was like, may I, 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 and I just couldn't stop going. Mm -hmm. And I just remember the entire class laughing at me very hard, making me feel, you know, very unwelcome. And then I remember the teacher saying, spit it out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, rem I remember uh, even some of the kids were, were like, wow, that was, you know, really rude. You, mm -hmm. shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have said that. Um, and I think this also kind of made me develop somewhat of an avoidance tendency. So when I would think that I'm going to stutter on a word, I would, you know, rapidly change the word in my mind. So if it was like an ST word, I would change it to something that had the same meaning, um, mm -hmm. but it was just a different word. So I developed fears of saying certain words. And when I couldn't think of something to replace it with, um, you know, like this was usually during like oral presentations, um, that was a big, a big problem for me. And I think there was also a little bit of social exile, like people didn't want to be friends with the weird kid who can't talk correctly. So it was challenging, but, you know, I, I was still able to make some extremely good friends that I still, you know, talk to and hang out with today. And mm -hmm. I think everyone finds their own people. And, you know, sometimes it's not a matter of how ig ignorant someone is. Sometimes they just, you just need to tell them that it's wrong and there's really not much you can do about it. And either they understand and they don't make those kinds of comments anymore or they don't, and then, you know, what can you do? So that's kind of like what it was like growing up as a kid who stuttered. I always ask people, what did stuttering mean 
as a child? What meaning did you attach to it? You know, I think as a child, it had a very different meaning for me than it does now. You know, I, I used to think of it as, as a curse. I used to think of it as something that was always going to bring me down in life and keep me from achieving my goals. And I don't know, I, I, I worried about things as a kid. I don't think a kid should necessarily worry about like, for example, this is going to sound outrageous, but I remember when I was like 10 years old, I was like, how am I going to propose to a girl one day? Like how, you know, that's a nervous, a nervous moment for anyone. How, how am I going to do that with this speech impediment? Um, right. So, you know, I used to think of it as something that was always going to bring me back from everything, hold me back from all my goals. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously I began seeing you and I began getting help and was coached through it uh, twice. And, you know, I think I began to see it as something that didn't define me anymore and like wasn't really a curse. Um, I think it became something that showed me the true definition of hard work um, mm -hmm. because I really had to go through some very difficult moments to sort of get to where I am right now. And obviously, you know, no one's perfect, but right now I feel like it's not something that defines me anymore. And it's something I have a lot better control over. So honestly, right now, I don't know how I would define it, but as a kid, it was definitely something that mm -hmm. I defined as a curse. That's deep. It's true. A kid, a third grader, a fifth grader, seventh grader, can begin to run movies, I call it. So for example, a third grader is going away for camp for the first time and he starts running a movie. What if everyone finds out I stutter? Yeah. Well, they want, I'm gonna be there for four weeks. If everyone finds out I stutter, they won't wanna do things with me. They won't choose to do the swimming that day with me or arts and crafts and then in your case, you ran a long range movie. Will I ever meet somebody? It's true, man. If you stutter, you know. I met a guy <clears throat> who was concerned about naming his son a particular name because he was afraid he was going to stutter. And he had a hellacious fight with his wife and in-laws because in his faith, you choose the name of a male elder who's deceased to honor that person. And everyone had concluded this particular name was the ideal name. But he started running a movie. I'm going to stutter on the name of my son. If I have to introduce him at the playground, if I have to call the school and say, I'm this is so-and-so, I'm going to come pick him up. If I have to make an appointment at the doctor's office, I'll be embarrassed to stutter in the name of my child. That's running a movie with layers and layers and layers of shame. Fortunately, we worked through all of that. It had a happy ending. He chose the name, the family chose the name, they embraced him. But that therein lies what I call a movie, a stutter movie. So you came in for a little bit as a kid and we did typical speech techniques. And as you mentioned, you started learning to change the definition of stuttering to work through some of the early teasing. Now, I remember when you returned in high school, some things that happened in modern day, people can have difficulty, not only with face-to-face -face teasing, but cyberbullying. Do, do you mind sharing a little bit of that? Yeah, I mean, there was definitely, <clears throat> Like, it was kind of interesting in a way because it was like once people defined you as a stutterer or someone who had a problem, mm -hmm. there was no escaping it. So I remember I would comment on something on Facebook in middle school or high school. And I, you know, obviously you don't hear someone, you know, when you read a comment, you just, you just, read the comment but i remember people would comment like hey sh -sh 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 sean like in the comment on facebook mm. so i didn't even st stutter in that moment but it's like as soon as you're defined as 
someone who has a problem, it's something worth making fun about. Mm. So, I mean, that was definitely interesting. And I think like, then there's this whole culture of like liking comments because they're funny. So it's like, it's not just bad that one person made fun of you on the internet. It's worse when like 10 or 20 people start liking the comment because they're also, Mm -hmm. you know, immature and it's funny to them. And I mean, that's messed up. I mean, that's the, you know, maturity level of someone who doesn't understand what it's like. And it's just, you know, finding it very funny that someone had the audacity to do that to you publicly. And something, something is difficult for somebody in high school is to call them out loudly and clearly because we can be afraid that if I were to right now message the group, do not mimic my stutter, that's not cool. We can be worried, will there be backlash? Will some people be like, oh, he's so uptight. You also had an experience where didn't you get yeah. like blocked out of some social groups after you did confront somebody? Yeah. So um, I don't remember that very clearly, but I think I remember what you're talking about. I think there was like a Facebook group where like certain people in a class would talk about like what the like class was about. Um, mm-hmm. And I think like sometimes they would like discuss maybe like maybe like the homework um and you know i I was not allowed in that group because i guess you know like it was there was just something i i guess it was like if if uh something was said against me or something like i might rat out the group like Mm -hmm. hey like this person made fun of my speech impediment in this private group um you know, I'm going to go take this to this school now where then everyone gets in trouble Mm -hmm. or something. Um, So it it was, you know, you definitely had to deal with a a different level of social exile just because you were different. Um, Yeah. One of the biggest, um, one of the biggest things that I have to do in therapy is help people with, with projecting their thoughts. So let's pretend I don't get invited to birthday parties and the social media is trending. Like there's all the photographs and little videos. I'm here, I'm here with, with my BFFs. Well, I can wonder, is it about my stuttering? Or let's pretend I did invite somebody to my party. And then three days later, they have a birthday party. They don't invite me. I can wonder, is it about my stuttering? And then all the photos start popping. I'm like, I'm being excluded. And, you know, if you've been teased or bullied about your stuttering, your mind can go there. Your mind can jump levels to, to imagine the reason why I wasn't invited to the party is because I stutter. They might not think I'm cool. So the internet has added different layers of cyberbullying. There's uh, Instagram, and then we know what Finsta is, fake Insta. So I know, I know. I know, I know that, right? So there, <laughs> it's like, I shouldn't know that, right? But if I work with teenagers who stutter, I'm going to find out about something called Finsta. So the Finsta group, just 10 people in a squad make fun of my stuttering behind my back. Yeah, that, That's a reality. You know it, I know it. I've experienced that. Yeah, so it was hard. When I was in high school, there were no computers, you know, no internet. I think there, I think we got to school on a horse. No, no, I'm mistaken. We, we, we had cars then, but um, <laughs> we did. Um, if you heard, you heard somebody talk smack about you the next day in the hallway, you would find out where they were going into classes. You'd walk up and you go, Hey man, did you really say that about me? Of course you'd bring a friend so that they had your back and you did you really say that about me well yeah man or no man i'm sorry i didn't i didn't mean it that way but we tended to talk things out face to face there's no substitute for that yeah so in summary there's a lot of different ways to get teased and bullied about stuttering right now and some of them are slippery and they're covert 
like Finsta or messaging about people whose daughter. There was a kid um, during the school at home here this spring who had to upload a video and he stuttered a lot and he was in seventh grade. So a lot of kids have their phones and he discovered that they were messaging about his stuttering. So he uploads a video, he's stuttering more than he would like to. And he finds out people are messaging about his stuttering. Like, hey, did you, did, did you hear him stutter, bro? So there's a lot of different ways to take heat at the end, at the end of the day, how tough does a kid who stutter have to be, Sean? Yeah, and I, I think that's what I was gonna say, um, you know, when you were done talking is that I think we've talked a lot about how I was bullied and teased and how it affected me as a kid. But if there's one thing I gained from that is that it taught me how to deal with, you know, those kinds of comments. It taught me, it made me a stronger person because mm -hmm. I had faced so much of that, that yes. it kind of, you know, normal things didn't really hurt as much anymore. Because when you make fun of something that someone cannot change, you know, I'm going to have this for the rest of my life. And so are you, so are you and so is everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, you kind of just learn how to deal with all of it and it makes you a more strong person but also you know normal things don't really hurt as much anymore like it makes like it, it just makes you more powerful inside um, and, and i think that's one of the biggest things i've gained from it mm -hmm. what i'd like to back up i want to assert that it's something that can change i think what you're saying is that i'm a person who stutters and I may have some stuttering for the rest of my life. I know you personally, and I know how much has changed. So it's not black and white, it's or either, or it's gray. And during your time period from middle school through high school, through college and employment, you've evolved into somebody that can speak in front of an audience. I've had you as a guest speaker at some of my seminars, and I have watched participants cry like babies because you have a way of articulating your stuttering past and present. And then we pop up a video of you at MLK's church and that always drives them to tears. It literally does. So I guess a person who stutters, there's no cure for stuttering. You may have a semblance of stuttering left over yet it is changeable. You've changed a lot. Do we agree on that? Yeah, I, you know, I definitely agree. Didn't mean to paint like a grim. It's picture, okay, man. It's okay. But um, obviously, like, I think if you can get help early enough, or if you can just get help at all, um, with all the different coaching strategies and, mm -hmm. you know, what, what not. <clears throat> I think mm -hmm. it can make a massive difference in, mm -hmm. in your speech. And I think, um, you know, I think you'll always have a little bit, but I think you can make an extremely large improvement. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing about stuttering, I think a point you might've been making was it's that first impression. We're vulnerable. We are standing there at a social thing and all of a sudden someone in front of me asked me what my name is. And there's three or four people I don't know all listening. And then I have a huge block in front of all these people. It's like, Oh, great. And that's the thing about it. We're, it's um, as so many people who stutter say that there's no indication we're going to stutter. And when we walk up to the store clerk or we order at a restaurant, or we get called us. No one, no one knows that we're about to stutter. Yeah. So would you expand on the MLK speech? Just give us a glimpse of how you were selected and then a little bit about how you got ready for it. Okay. Um, so I was selected in that I think they were going out to more diverse high schools and I went to an international school. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, they were basically looking for high achieving students who came from minority backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm Pakistani. Um, well, I'd say I'm Pakistani American. So that's kind of like how I was chosen. I was nominated by my high school um, as someone who fit that, uh, you know, impression, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that I prepared for it was very, very challenging. I'll say, I think it was more difficult than speech therapy. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was one of the most challenging things I had to go through because I had to live through how bad my stutter was mm. before it got, it got, it got better. Mm -hmm. So the person who was the head of the speech, um, she realized that I had a speech impediment and I think she realized that I had it, but I don't think she really realized that it wasn't really in my control. Mm -hmm. um, so she would just say like, like I would recite like my two paragraphs that I was going to recite on the day. And she would just say, that was great just do it again but don't stutter <laughs> and, oh my gosh um, like i would be like well it's not it's not really something i can control but then you know she found something that really worked for me and mm -hmm. you know if you watch the recording of the speech you'll see that after i say something the other students who were nominated would say something in re return yes and i think that that kind of reminded me that like I am the only one behind the microphone, but I'm not alone. Mm. And everyone in this room wants me to su succeed. I might be telling myself that, you know, I might be making up this movie where it's like I go up there and I can't even get out the first sentence, mm -hmm. right? And everyone begins laughing and I get booed off. But, you know, what if you can change your mentality and have a movie where it's, you know, you go up there and you just go crazy. Like it's just the best speech you could possibly give. Yeah. And honestly, you know, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I think that that speech went the best it could possibly go. You know, not, not only because I didn't stutter once throughout the entire, I think one and a half minutes that I was up there, Mm -hmm. but also because of the amount of emotion that the crowd was conveying. Like the crowd yes. was getting excited when I was saying it is, it is normalcy this, it is normalcy that, um, you know, that mm -hmm. it was extremely challenging because I feel like I had to go through the same words that I would stutter on time oh, and time again yes, yes. in front of a group of 14 kids this mm -hmm. person who was heading this speech and mm -hmm. all of their parents in the room. And I remember sometimes the parents would be like, Oh, that's so sad. Like, Oh no. Like something's, something's wrong with him. Like, Oh no, that's so sad. Like it would kind of make me feel embarrassed. Cause it was like, you don't have to feel sorry for me. Like I've been through this my whole life. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it was, it was that experience really taught me like, how to deal with it, but also mm -hmm. how to sort of get more comfortable with it so that I can still do things that normal people would want to do. Such yes. As public speaking. For those of you who want to see the speech, and I know you do, you can go on to YouTube, put my name, Tim Mackesy, and there's a channel. If you scroll down, you'll be able to see the actual speech that Sean's talking about. And it is the bomb. It really is. You put everything together. And as you mentioned, you're able to block out the notion of I'm here alone at the church, that I'm, I'm supported by the group behind me. And I've seen it. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's the psychology. It's maybe if I'm, if I'm going to kick in football, you know, I have to zero in and focus. I have to remove chatter such as don't miss it, don't miss it, and focus on seeing it go through the uprights and scoring. Um, so there's a lot of psychology as you've learned in speech therapy, a lot of it. Um, so then you went on to undergraduate at Emory. Yes. And give us a glimpse of some of the speech, speech challenges you had to confront in college. Um, you know, I would say 
educationally, it was again, giving presentations in front of the class. Um, in high school, I think I had a note from you that would give me extended time for all oral presentations mm -hmm. um, in college. You know, it was a lot less structured than that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I would just go up to the teacher and tell them that I have a speech impediment. And, um, you know, I think everyone was very tolerable about that. Uh, I also think the penalty for, I don't know, like the penalty for like laughing at someone or the penalty for making fun of someone during a college presentation, would it actually be higher? You know, I thought you could get in big trouble in, you know, high school because you could get suspended or something for bullying. But in college, like, I think the, the professors would take it a lot more seriously. Um, I kind of felt like they were on my team. Mm -hmm. um, so that definitely made it easier. But obviously, it was very nerve wracking to go up in front of 40 kids um, being graded on a curve and, you know, asking them to be tolerant of you when you're trying to get an A and only so many A's can be given. Um, so that was just one of the difficult parts. I think the more difficult part was just meeting new people. Um, because sometimes if I was going through a stressful time, like I had a paper and a, and a you know, a midterm and something to, to, you know, do for one of my clubs in, in interviews all, you know, at the same week, I was stuttering more because I was just under a lot more pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's always that fear where it's like, you just can't get your words out and then someone just walks away. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, never happened. But again, it's another one of those movies you play in your, in your, your head. You just, I feel like you are your worst enemy. Um, and, you know, I found it very difficult to meet new people at times um, because I was afraid that they were going to, you know, single me out or just think I was weird because of the speech impediment that I had. Right, and, right. you know, honestly, in the four years that I was there, I never met anyone else with a stutter. Hmm. So that almost made it kind of worse because it was like, who is going to understand if no one else, you know, has this? Yeah, I'm, you raise an important point, and that was going to your teachers and telling them you stutter. That's important because... First of all, their testing bias, their grading bias, they can't take off for us and ums or hesitations, which actually might be in the grading scale. And then by telling the teacher you stutter, some of the monkey is off your back, the um, worry that, that everyone's going to find out. that Like going into the speech thinking, I can't stutter. My speech has to be perfect. You've already told the teacher you stutter. So their grading will be, they'll be aware of it. They'll also probably pick up if there's any facial expressions or anything going on in the classroom because you've told them. And so many people are trying to shield and hide the fact that they stutter. So then you went on from your undergraduate school to your first career in New York City. Is that where you went? Uh, actually, I did in internship in new york okay um i kind of realized that after having lived in atlanta for 24 years new york was just just not really for me um mm -hmm. i thought it was a great place to visit and have fun with friends but i think actually you know living there full time was something that was not going to be a great fit okay. so my first job i was actually in atlanta and i was working in investment banking um, yeah it was a great experience. You know, I think I definitely learned a lot about business. Um, and I think it was also a way to prove to myself that like my sp speech impediment was never going to hold me back from my goals. Mm -hmm. I think I've always been a very ambitious person. Um, and, you know, I, I think proving to myself that I could go through rounds of interviews under a lot of pressure and still get the job. Although I had trouble getting my words out at some, some point, you know, proved to me that I was more capable than what I thought I was of. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I that's think wonderful. There's so many people who think if I interview and stutter once, I'm not going to get it. Um, now your native language, your, 
you're born in America, your family has a, a, a tongue. What what language does your family speak? My family speaks Urdu. Now you mentioned that's ordinarily spoken quickly. Yeah, it's usually spoken pretty quickly, which, as you may know, is kind of like the last thing you want to do when you have a <laughs> stutter, because that's that's kind of somewhat fuel it or somewhat aggravate it. Um, and I think it was a little challenging because I think my family who I wasn't as close to maybe like aunts or, aunts or uncles who you see, you know, once every couple of years, um, you know, they, they kind of didn't really know what it was. Um, and I think they expect you to speak it quickly. So it's kind of like, they think that you don't know how to speak the language correctly because you're not speaking it at, at the same pace that you, sh that you should be. Mm -hmm. you know, I think when you don't really know a language, you speak it more sl slowly. Um, just because you don't really know all the verb conjugations, you don't really know all the word translations immediately. Yep. So I think that's what that's what they thought was happening. When I really, you know, I did know how to speak the language fluently. Actually, Urdu was my first word uh, was my first language. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was my speech impediment, and I think you know. My, my parents knew by age three, like it was almost as soon as I began talking that I had trouble getting my words out. Right. Um, but, you know, so, we, so. So when family heard you speaking and they heard you, what they interpreted your stuttering as was he doesn't know the language as well as we think he should. Yeah. So w were they prone to try to correct you? to correct me, finish my sentences for me. I mean, yeah. does that sound familiar for someone who has oh, a yeah. stutter? So Yes, yes. Yeah, I've met, I've met off your sentences. I, that's the worst. I hate that so much. Mm. I've, met, I've met a lot of people who speak Spanish and Spanish is often spoke very quickly. I could never survive <laughs> speaking yeah. that quickly. Um, so what are you doing for work now? So now I work as a senior financial analyst uh, at a company called Newell Brands. Mm. Um, honestly, I, uh, I think it's a pretty interesting job um, and I do enjoy, you know, what I do. Um, I think, you know, the work-life balance is a, is a little bit better um, mm. and it's kind of given me time to be able to focus on other things as well. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't have had the time to do something like, like, like this in my <laughs> previous job. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I enjoy it. Um, and I mean, I think it's just another thing where all those interviews I did were over Zoom. I was actually hired during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I stuttered a lot during the interviews. Um, and funnily enough, I think uh, the interviewers may have to an extent thought it was like an internet connection lag or something. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got away with it. How convenient. Um, right. <laughs> hey, I got the job. So, yay. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just important to me that if I can set a goal for myself, that something like a stutter is not going to hold me back. I remember taking the job offer on the phone and I like one of the things was, you know, every quarter you have to like present something to the senior vice president. And I have a thing with, with titles where I get really nervous mm. when I speak to someone who's really important. And, um, you know, I, I told my 2B manager and now manager then that like, I have a speech impediment and he was like, I didn't even notice. Mm. Um, and I was like, well, that's great. Hopefully you, you, you know, you never notice, but um, if I do present something to someone, I just want you to know that like, I do have a speech impediment. And obviously, you know, he made me feel very comfortable where he was like, no, I don't think it's a big, a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like we're here to invest in you and make you s succeed. So I think. Um, I love that. We're here to invest in you and make you succeed. Exactly. And I, you I are more than stuttering. There's. Exactly, exactly. And that bears a very sharp contrast to like my childhood. 
So I think it shows, I think it shows that things can get, can get better. Yes. Um, and not everyone is out there to sort of be, be, be against you and like, not, you know, everyone wants to see you fail right. and all, all those things. Um, and so I think it was really important for me to see a sharp contrast in a, in a way where someone doesn't judge you for it. In fact, they want to work with you mm -hmm. and, you know, make you the best version of yourself. And that's, so I'm that's, very, that's very how grateful. every employer should be, you know, Jack Welch passed away probably April of 2020. He was the chairman of GE for a number of years. He had a, a, an everyday stutter. It wasn't he stutters once a week, but he was named the manager of the century in 2000. And he, was a, he led the company for I don't know how many years. And, but he did increase the, the revenues of GE by sevenfold. So a man with a stutter. And so many people have mimicked the culture that he created, the developing talent, who to invest in, how to scrutinize the kind of employee that's one you want to make happy and keep forever, but great manager, a man, man with a stutter. So people who stutter can achieve amazing things. Now, there's something connected here. One is your school nominated you to speak at the MLK weekend in Atlanta, Georgia, even though you stuttered. So the school, the, like the only dude in your school with a stutter is nominated to represent the school. Then here in 2020, who does the school ask to do a fundraising speech that is able to fetch a couple hundred thousand dollars. So what does your school think of Sean? Um, well, I think I can basically only say that I'm very grateful that uh, they have presented me with those opportunities to kind of prove to myself that I am more than what I think I am. Um, I think, you know, I think they think that I am capable of, I guess, representing this school in some sense. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's really good to kind of see that something like important, you know, wants to see you succeed. S something important invests in you and mm -hmm. tries to you know, make you more visible. And I, I mean, so like after I gave the um, fundraising speech, well, actually not just after that, um, I also volunteered to give my high school graduation speech. Mm. Um, and I remember after that speech, I saw a lot of parents crying. And after we all graduated and, you know, everyone dispersed, I remember like seeing teachers who had taught me since the sixth grade when I was new. Mm -hmm. And obviously when I was new, I was really afraid of people noticing that I stuttered and I was really socially awkward. I didn't have a lot of friends and I was the new kid. Um, I remember them saying to me, like, you know, it's amazing to see how much you've grown. Like you were that kid who couldn't even introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and now you're giving the graduation speech. So I think, to answer your question, like, what does my school or like, what does my high school think of me? You know, I think they're in a way, I would say that the, the faculty and the students are probably very proud of the progress that I've made. Um, and I, and I think like, they hope that I continue achieving these kinds of things um, mm -hmm. because the fundraising speech was the third engagement that I gave for the school. The first one was the MLK, mm -hmm. then the graduation, and then, mm -hmm. and then this. So, you know, I, I think it's really a good confidence boost to know that yeah. someone believes in you. I know why they picked you. Why? Without, without them telling me. 
Okay. I've never asked them. They never, they never called and said, hey, should we pick Sean? You, so you pick a student, now someone that went to school, their past tense, the only person maybe that stuttered during that whole time duration, because you're a complete package, you, the stuttering brings out in you some modesty, um, very authentic, yet you present yourself, you speak, I've seen you speak in front of an audience, so I know the way that you hold their attention. Um, to take a little journey, a very short journey to the Bible, when Moses, uh, the, only, the only disciple with a stutter, is asked by God to go to Egypt and to lead the people from Egypt, the only person with a stutter is given the responsibility because God knew he was more than stuttering. He could coordinate this, he could communicate, he could lead, he could convince. And it's, God knew he was more than stuttering. In your situation, the school is like, this young man, he might stutter. The thing is, is he embodies everything that our school stands for. Stands, our school stands for diversity and inclusion. And he's a great communicator through the occasional stutter. That's why I think they picked you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for kids who stutter? That's a great question. Um, you know, obviously, I was a kid who had a pretty bad stutter. Um, I'm not sure if you remember when I first came to see you. Things I were do. very different. I do. Things were very different. Um, you know, I get, I get that it's very hard. I get that it affects your self confidence. I get that it can be daunting at times and can make you kind of socially awkward and can make you sort of feel like you aren't enough at times. I've mm -hmm. been there and I've experienced that, mm -hmm. but I am here to tell you that I think it gets a lot better if you put in the hard work and you do these coaching exercises and you continue to challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this is going to sound really easy to just tell you, but you should not try to avoid situations in which you think you're going to stutter a lot. So if you want to go to that summer camp for four weeks, don't let your speech impediment be a reason why you don't go. Cause it'll be a, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to give a speech, don't be afraid to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think back to speech therapy and some of the tactics that worked the best for me. And, you know, I think we played board games like apples to apples. We read presidential speeches in front of the mirror, mm -hmm. which, which that kind of gave me a self of, a sense of self uh, confidence where like maybe one day I could, you know, be a good public speaker and motivate people, yep. uh, which I think I did go on to, you know, do. Um, mm -hmm. But honestly, and this is going to sound kind of funny, but the most, you know, valuable experience I had from speech therapy with uh, you was getting in the car with you and driving to Wendy's or Chick-fil-A and ordering in the, drive through because mm -hmm. um, that was a very practical experience yeah you know it was kind of like this is real life like one day you're gonna have mm -hmm. to order food for yourself in the drive through mm -hmm. and you know what's more important that you stutter that mm -hmm. you're gonna that you're gonna talk to this person for maybe five seconds of your life and then never mm -hmm. talk to them ever again or yeah. that you're hungry you know and i think it's experiences like that that teach you that life is way more than what your stutter is. And there's always like a silver lining. I love lining. that. Life is more than what the stutter is. And what's the silver lining, Sean? It's, it's that, you know, you may think that you're not normal. You may think that you have a big problem, a big issue. This is going to hold you back forever. Like you're never going to, you mm. know, be able to accomplish certain things. But that's really not the case. And I genuinely think it's really all in your head. 
And I think that you are your biggest critic and you are your biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to change that mindset internally. And I, you know, obviously a stutter is a real thing. It's a verbal thing. And it's something that you can control to an extent, but you'll never have a hundred percent control of. And I think a part of like, you know, life is just becoming more comfortable with it, gaining control over Mm -hmm. it and kind of just, you know, real realizing that you're giving stuttering the front seat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the it's the driver in the car and you're the passenger and i feel mm, like it needs to deep. be you know it needs to be like something in your trunk and you're like, oh, i love that i love that that's kind of like what i tell like myself before i get really really nervous about something it's like mm. i am more than what this thing is and it's just it's just something that is there. I love it. I love it. Love it. You know, way in the beginning, I asked you, what did it mean to you to start as a child? And you told everybody what it meant to you. And then <clears throat> I asked people, what does it mean to you now? And I love that you said, I shove it in the trunk. It's a little part of me that I am more than stuttering. I go through my day with knowing that I might stutter. However, I'm going to meet and greet and speak up and be assertive. And when my school asked me to come and speak in front of a big audience, I'll do it. Um, That's a complete change of meaning. It's the identity of stuttering. Uh, When you're a little kid, the identity of a stutterer, it's like we just think about stuttering so much. And that when, when people think of me, they just think of my stuttering. And now you've changed the meaning. And that's the greatest thing that anyone can do. There was a young man that grew up here in Atlanta, Georgia, who wrote a book called No Excuses, Kyle Maynard. Kyle Maynard was born with no arms and no legs. And he refused prosthetic limbs his entire life. He went out for wrestling here in high school. He was zero and 40. When people try to talk him out of wrestling, they're like, Kyle, you tried it, man. Clearly, wrestling's not the thing for you. But he didn't quit. Otherwise, the story would stink. I think senior year, he was 20 and 14 with eight pins. A young man with no arms and no legs pinned eight people on high school wrestling mats. People began to fear him. Then he, he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa with custom made teeny snowshoes. Now, if you think about it, if you have no arms and no legs, what I mean by no arms and no legs, he had uh, his arms at birth didn't go to the elbow and his legs didn't go to the knee. He had custom made snowshoes. If you start imagining it, he just faced the ground right? He can't stand erect. So you climb a mountain facing the ground. Why do you do it? Because it's going to prove something to yourself. Yeah. Um, So Kyle Maynard is not defined by being born with with no limbs. And another uh, incredible uh, website is Life, Life Without Limbs. The Australian guy who literally... Um, he has one digit coming out of, I believe, where his left leg would be. It's one digit. And that one digit is able to control a custom-made w- wheelchair that sits high like like a stool. And he's an incredible speaker. Nick, Nick is his first name. Um, a huge theme here is if you let yourself be defined by dyslexia, defined by stuttering, defined by the, 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 the loss of limbs, for example. So um, you have very sage advice. Um, I'm always working with teachers too, to understand what stuttering is and to accommodate kids versus excuse kids. As you mentioned, you have to, fee- you have to uh, face your fear. If we always excuse excuse children then the fear is emboldened the, through avoidance and 
an adult saying, you don't have to talk in front of the class. We'll let you record it on video. You're the only one that can do it. But as you've learned, you had to face your fear. Do you have any, any final thoughts for us, Sean? Um, you know, I, I, I think I've kind of already said uh, mm -hmm. as much as I can, but if I were to say one final thing, I would just say like, never lose sight of your goals. Um, just because you have a stutter or even if you don't just because, you know, you may think that you can't accomplish something and you may not, but what if you can? And, you know, like I never thought in second grade when I couldn't even ask to use the restroom, I'd be raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'd be speaking on live, te live television. I'd be giving the graduation speech. I'd be at nonprofit launches. I'd be at mm -hmm. nonprofit seminars. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I never, I never thought that I would be doing those kinds of things. I never even fathomed that those were in my capability, mm -hmm. but, you know, I think you and my family and my friends, they never, and, you know, obviously myself as well. I never let, I never really let myself lose sight of what I wanted to achieve no matter how daunting it was that this mm -hmm. was going to be something that was there. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had any final thoughts, I would just say that, you know, never give up because something may seem really difficult, but when you do achieve it and like you, you, you may fail you, I mean, you probably will fail multiple times, but that kind of only makes mm -hmm. the end result more rewarding when you can finally go up there with confidence and not have to think uh, like, you know, Oh no, ST word. This is, this is, this is it for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, when you just say it, I stutter, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a really powerful feeling. And I think that's what you have to, you know, for the kids out there and for the adults out there, like it's a really powerful feeling to know that, you can overcome this and that you can prove to yourself that you are more than what this thing has made you think you are. Um, so those are kind of like my final thoughts, like just being able to say I stutter and that you're more than stuttering. I am more than this thing called stuttering and never give up. Listen, man, it was so nice talking with you this, this evening. I'm really, really proud of you. Your family is so proud of you, your school, and all of your friends that have seen you grow and expand. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much, Tim. All right.